Welcome to Garden DC, the podcast about everything gardening in the Washington DC and Mid-Atlantic region. I'm your host, Kathy Jentz. I'm the editor of Washington Gardener Magazine, and we're aimed at gardening enthusiasts, people who grow everything from edibles to ornamentals, natives to exotics. If it grows in our area, that's what we talk about. Welcome to episode 173 of the Garden DC podcast. In this episode, we chat with Carol Reese, retired extension horticultural specialist, about native plant fallacies. The plant profile is on sweet gum, and we share what's going on in the garden, as well as some upcoming local gardening events in the What's New segment. We close out with a last word on cooking with pumpkins by Christy Page at the Food Gardening Network. This episode, we're joined by Carol Reese. She is an, a retired extension horticultural specialist and a nationally known speaker about gardening and a well-known garden writer. Welcome, Carol. Hello, Kathy. Good to talk to you again. Really enjoyed hanging with you some up at the Minneapolis meeting. Great to have you, Carol. And so for listeners who are interested, we hung out in Minneapolis, Minnesota during the Garden Communicators Association annual meeting, and it was beautiful weather, beautiful gardens, and we really got to spend some quality time together. And everybody that goes should stay for that last day of the private garden tours. That was just fabulous. Mm -hmm. Definitely. So, Carol, we like to ask our guests here on the Garden DC podcast, were they born with chlorophyll in their veins and a green thumb? I was definitely born with chlorophyll in my veins. I've often told the story that my grandfather, who actually was a country veterinarian, was also a gardener and even wrote a gardening column for one of the small towns in North Mississippi. But he was a showman. Oh, my goodness. Chewed a cigar, wore a big Panama hat, and he would dynamite his garden spot every spring, mainly to get attention, but he called it breaking up his hard pan. (laughs) Wow, that's dramatic. So uh, from those green thumb beginnings as a child, you were in a family of gardeners. What were your first childhood plant memories? Uh, We called him Doc because he was a vet. And a thing I remember is him peeling a cold turnip for me as we stood out in the garden and him cutting me off crispy bites, sweet and eating English peas right off the vine. But also, it was the fact that I was raised on a farm that was run by my mother. Uh, My father was a businessman, but Mama had decided she really wanted to raise her seven kids that she had in 11 years, and yes, she was Catholic, and my father was Baptist, so I, I feel entitled to make fun of both. She ran the farm, and she broke records. Um, she became a great mechanic. She took art at night over at the Mississippi State College for Women. So I thought everybody's mama could paint and sculpt and fix hay balers. Wow. She sounds like quite a woman. She was. She was. And she read everything under the sun. Uh, she, Because she was an artist, she often studied the trees and all the shades of green and the way they branched. So when I got to be a smart aleck, um, In graduate school, I was teaching plant materials, and I would show her the details on a tree, and she'd say, honey, I know that. And I'd say, how how would you know that, mama? Because I actually look at things. (laughs) (laughs) Excellent. So you naturally pursued a career in horticulture from that (laughs) green thumb beginning. No, Um, no, no, I didn't. (laughs) No, 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 I didn't. I was an English major to start with, which I know... To be an English major from Mississippi is an oxymoron. (laughs) But the party girl years are actually what ripped me um, out of school. And about 11 years into it, I decided the brain cells were getting so scarce, I had better straighten up. Uh, Went back to the farm and decided to try to study something to do with our property. We were no longer a dairy farm. And that's how I discovered plant materials. I already loved and always explored you know, bringing home things in my pocket when I would ride my horse all over the countryside. So it it just came naturally. Latin seemed easy. 
the plants kind of spoke to me and told me what they were. And I just felt like I found the river that carried me toward my career and everything happened after that. And that was only half my life ago. I mean, I'd just gotten fired from waiting tables at lunch for being intoxicated. And that wasn't the first time, right? <laughs> so half my life ago, that's where I was. And now I'm actually the owner of 118 acres of wild land that uh, I use as a dog rescue. People who know me know my passion besides gardening is rescuing dogs that have nowhere else to go. And I uh, built a simple little house for the dogs and, and for a couple of humans that actually live there too. Hmm. Wonderful. Can you describe a little bit about your growing conditions, like the soil, your zone, and, and what you like to grow? Well, I am in zone seven. I'm, I'm a true seven, not a bee. And it's very hilly, my terrain, which is unusual for West Tennessee. Most of West Tennessee is flat cropland, uh, corn, soybeans, and cotton, et cetera, winter wheat. But my land was steep and thin and hilly. So it had never been farmed. The only thing that had ever been done is it had, had been timbered. And that was why I was able to buy the 100 acres cheaply. It had just been cut. And so it had no real worth. So I had, I don't know if I should confess how little I paid for my original 100 acres. And then I went ahead and bought the 18 across the road so that nobody could build. I'm, I'm, I'm a, I love freedom and I'm a hermit and I can garden all day in my nightgown out there. I'm way off the road and I can just piddle to my heart's content. So that is my land. It's acid and a thin sandy layer over a clay base. And I am a fan of clay soils. I'm a fan of acid soils. I mean, Mother Nature knows what grows there and what works, and I just imitate her. It's got wild um, blueberry species. Vaccinium arboreum is very common around here. It doesn't. It's not really picky. But I also have vaccinium corimbosum variety if you skate them. So I knew what my soil was just by seeing what the plants were. A lot of the legumes because it's poor in nitrogen. But because it had never been farmed, it also had some things that are unusual in West Tennessee. I found soapwort gentian. I found yellow lady slipper orchid. Mm -hmm. Lots of smooth hydrangeas, which are pretty common around here, but maidenhair fern was a little more rare. Uh, I had a few sourwoods, which is not uncommon in certain parts, but it's an easy one to kill. I've tried to grow it in places in lowland settings and killed it. But here in these uplands, it's very happy. And I call it upland relatively, right? West Tennessee is still only a few hundred feet above sea level. One more challenge was the, ex the extreme heat. We are, we're about an hour and a half from Memphis. My property is between Nashville and Jackson. Jackson, Tennessee is where I worked at the experiment station for the University of Tennessee Extension. Um, and it's about halfway between Nashville and Memphis. So if that puts me on, on the planet, you can kind of see where I am. Hmm. Yeah, we're kind of stretching our, our mid-Atlantic out, uh, you know, a bit to include Tennessee. But I think we have a lot in common with our clay soils. Kind of, some of us have lots of hilly terrain. Mm -hmm. And also I'm zone 7, um, as much of the mid-Atlantic is. Right. And I think we grow a lot of the same plants. That's, I, I know we do. Mm -hmm. We've looked at each other's Facebook pages enough. <laughs> <laughs> and I think, yeah, they're pretty much blooming and up and out at around the same time, which is a good indication. True. Mm. So our topic of the hour is native plant fallacies, mm -hmm. foibles, and facts. Mm -hmm. And... I wanted to start off a little bit about um, natives versus non-natives. So what is your definition of a native that you personally use, Carol? Well, I use lots of things that people would consider native. Oak leaf hydrangea, smooth hydrangea, mini oaks, dogwoods, red buds, uh, fox, uh, coreopsis, uh, echinacea, the people who think that, you know, natives are kind of rare and hard to find, uh, sweet bay magnolias, magnolias. I mean, our garden centers are chock full of them around here, and they are a staple. Mm -hmm. But I'm going to contest the meaning of native over time. I uh, think that we as um, sort of egocentric Europeans want to date everything to when we arrived. So let's just say, for example, if something arrived 
50 years before we did. And we found it here, we would consider it native. When of course it could have been brought in by hurricanes or birds or you know drift. I also kind of challenged, let's go further back because where did Native Americans come from, right? They came over the Siberian land bridge from Asia. And if you go further back, the only humans that are actually native to the continent on which they arose are Africans. Mm. So we have to remember these land bridges connected North America, both the Siberian landmass and then the one that connected Greenland to what is now, I think, Sweden, Finland area and on over into Northern Asia. So there was a lot of, there's a great article at the Arnold Arboretum that talks about the first botanists when they were sort of going through the forest of East Asia were having deja vu that the plants were so similar that at first they even thought some were exactly the same species and that the changes were just uh, minutely different because when they did get here, there was very little need for those plants to change down here in the southeast where I live because the climate is so similar to southeastern Asia. Uh, We're on the same part of a continent, the lower southeast edge. I I love weather and climatology, and I took a lot of climatology in school, so I understand how the spinning of the planet creates these weather zones that can be similar all around the globe simply by where you are in relationship to the equator. So they didn't change much. So we are very, very closely related to the southeastern flora. Mm -hmm. Yeah, I often say there's almost always a Southeast Asian counterpart to our native one. And Mm -hmm. when I'm giving talks, I usually will mention both of them, say fringe tree is one good example of that. And one that's successful, you know, the Asian variety, as well as the native one in our gardens. True, yes. Well, how about an example of a non-native exotic that has been pilloried, um, and that is Budlia. So let's talk about some of the myths and fallacies around that. Thank you for bringing that one up. I think the first time that I got attacked for recommending non-natives, it was about Budlia. And the quote was that you might as well pave your yard if you're going to plant Budlia, because nothing could eat the foliage. Um, Well, turns out, number one, that's not true. There are native butterflies that have adapted to using Budlia as a host plant. Uh, This has been documented on the West Coast. I don't know that anybody's done the necessary work to document it here on the East Coast, but we do know that they will. And also, I want to contest the idea that everything has to have foliage for insect herbivory. Um, Nectar is certainly an important thing for all insects. So, because this plant blooms all summer and provides nectar all summer, even if it weren't used for herbivory, wouldn't that be better than, let's say, a native plant that had a very brief bloom season and that did not have insect herbivory whatsoever? Um, I like to compare it to, say, our native Elysium parviflorum, one of my very favorite plants to recommend for screens because it'll mm-hmm. work in dense shade, sun, dry or moist soil, uh, but nothing will touch the leaves. It actually is toxic to insects. So does that make Elysium parviflorum useless? Its bloom season is brief. Budlia blooms all summer. So if I'm just wanting to provide nectar, is that a, a cardinal sin? I know the invasiveness has been called into question. We know now that it does some places and not others. It isn't shade tolerant. So if you let a eastern woodland go back into natural succession, it's going to be shaded out. And the other thing is that they now breed for sterile cultivars if that is a concern. So everybody says, well, they can revert back. Yes, they can. And when I get in my car today and drive home, I might get smashed by a truck. (laughs) Good point. And yeah, I would say, you know, if you do have a Budlia, you inherited one or you're in love with it in your landscape, that simply deadheading it at the end of the season um, will keep a lot of that reseeding in control. True. And it, frankly, it doesn't much around here. I've, I've seen it happen a couple of times here on our display gardens, but none of the Budlia that I've grown at my home have ever reseeded. Mm-hmm. So um, we're evaluating native plants, their value. Um, as you said, 
they're looking just at whether the foliage can be consumed by insects. So that's a very narrow category. But what are the other ways our plants can be of value, whether they're native or non-native? Well, plants do everything. My goodness, everybody talks about, you know, food source and how we're going to need the bees to pollinate our food. And I think, <clears throat> have they forgotten air? <laughs> You know, it's like all plants do something good. They provide cover, uh, shelter, nest sites. They they cleanse the air. They remove pollution and, and take in carbon. My gosh, we know how important that is now. And create oxygen. They anchor soil. They create soil. They're used in phytoremediation. The uh, much maligned mimosa tree, uh, Albizia julie brisson, volunteers on these, some of these ruined sites where they've done strip mining, for example, and will clean up that soil. So uh, what I'm asking people to do is reevaluate each plant for its own merits in today's disturbed ecosystem. Because I don't know of any of our native plants that are volunteering to do that, and they may, there may be some. But when I drive down this huge interstate, I-40, that you know, bisects Tennessee uh, latitudinally. Mm -hmm. I see so many volunteers out there that are non-native, the, the clovers, the Queen Anne's lace, that are holding soil, absorbing pollution, uh, providing for pollinators, and, and nobody had to plant them there. If you, when you hear that native plants are better adapted, then I say, then why aren't they there? I think Sometimes we think we know better than Mother Nature. Mother Nature says, hey, you know what? These plants are just doing great. Could y'all quit telling me what I need to do? Because maybe maybe me and the insects are trying to tell you what we need. It's, a, again, a little bit of a human arrogance that we are sitting down to a plate of uh, Eurasian food. All our, all our foods came from that area. The only, only native food you can find with any regularity in the grocery stores are blueberries. But well, we sit down to a non-native food and tell these insects, but no, 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 you have to stick to native. <clears throat> That's so true that um, merit instead of origins yes. was a quote I got from you, mm -hmm. um, that we should be looking at those um, and what the plants are actually doing and the spaces that they're filling rather than where they originally came from. Um, so you're using some of the examples of the roadside fill-ins and disturbed soils and i would say you know construction sites new um landscapes before they are filled in by mm -hmm. a landscape architect or sodded over with turf grass will often have a colony of uh, non-natives coming in and that would be described as some people as an invasion uh, of these non-natives and I would describe it as pioneer species that are trying to heal the earth. That Mother Nature is, says, I'm trying to use these to heal the earth. Uh, you know, just let me progress. But where we continue to scar it, they continue to persist. Um, often, if we would just let these plants go back to a, a natural succession, they wouldn't. And the ones that do, maybe they are better adapted. That's one thing I think um, we have to start thinking about, and there are a lot of people who have written about this. I could give you some names to further research. Uh, Matt Chu would be one. Dr. Matt Chu was a native enthusiast, and he was in charge of re restoration and ecology. I can't remember the exact terms, but he's Arizona. And he began to notice that he calls them novel ecosystems instead of invasive. He said that the wildlife began to adapt to it. It became a boon. He saw it restore. And a good example he talks about is Eastern Tamarisk. You remember all the furor about Eastern Tamarisk, that it was displacing native vegetation along Western rivers and supposedly sucking up the water and uh, destroying the ecosystems. But over time, as he watched them, he saw that they actually restored uh, wildlife populations. And he, he completely changed his mind. He began to think of this in a different way, how quickly we do adapt. We used to think evolution took a long time. Now we know, even for insects, that it only takes maybe a few generations of insects. Um, it's amazing how fast. I remember the first time that hit me, I had read about, and this is a horrible topic, that they were using some kind of fox in Siberia for a specially prized 
fur coat, but they were very vicious and hard to handle. So they began to select the most docile pup out of each litter, and within seven generations, they had an animal that was easy to handle, that was acted like a dog. So a horrible example, but a, another example of how fast evolution can and does happen, and we know that this does happen in the insect world very, very quickly. Hmm. Yeah, it reminds me of um, the brown marmorated stink bug invasion uh, a few years on, ago on the East Coast. And, you know, those first couple of years, they were a terror. And then the birds started to figure out that these are edible. Uh-huh. Things usually do balance out. Mother Nature is able to do that. Uh, Dr. Arthur Shapiro um, on the West Coast, he was at UC Davis, I believe. I can send you the link. He has, in his studies, revealed that 34% of California's native butterflies now use non-native plants. 34% now use non-native plants. And one of my favorite things that my friend uh, Mary McAllister just recently sent me this, a quote, he, he was, had a visiting British ecologist, and he and the graduate students were taking a trip up to the hills of the Sierra Nevada, and they began to apologize for the invasives there. And uh, he said, uh, looks to me like tremendous, tremendous ecological opportunities. So I like seeing that in, in this framework. I mean, I'm, I'm 72 years old. And as I've walked around in my lifetime, because that's my passion, I love to be outdoors. I've always gone and wandered and looked and collected and observed the flora and fauna and the interactions and the migrations and what's using what. And I saw with my own eyes that insects, including caterpillars, would use non-native plants. So I knew that was wrong the first time someone told me that. Now, I know that's anecdotal, but don't doubt your own eyes to send you then into deeper research. Look for the research that validates what you've seen, and you'll find it. Instead of just reading over and over what you hear, like the lawns are an ecological desert, right? Yet my lawn, peppered with any kind of weed that wants to grow there, is it's it's in fact avian research has shown lawns have actually increased populations of certain birds. The bluebirds, crows, phoebes, they all love to feed on lawns. And in fact, um, bluebirds will not nest where there isn't open habitat. So they actually prefer the suburban landscape is now the most diverse avian population. And that's worldwide, not in the country, not in the deep country and not in the city, but where we have a huge mixture of diverse plants and habitats, long shrub borders, trees, long shrub borders, trees. That's where they want to be. And that's where they are. And, it, and the origins don't matter. And let me, give, let me quote someone who has more gravitas than I. Uh, Rick Dark says, and this is his quote. I talked to him at the West Virginia Nursery and Landscape Association last year. He said, let's start measuring plants on a scale of generosity, not on origins. Now, he co-authored a native plant book with Doug Tallamy. Hmm. Yeah, I think Rick has some really interesting ideas. And I, I remember that he had a definition of native that I, I like to use a lot. And that's a plant or, you know, could be a, a creature or animal or other aspect of the environment that has adapted to its environment and created a beneficial relationship with something in it. I like that. Um, mm -hmm. So that's something that's actually beneficial and you know, found this little niche there. So it's much more broad than going by a date, but by relationships with the plants. Yes, indeed. So I, I, that's what I want. I, I somehow have gotten a, a reputation for being against natives. Um, not at all. I'm for all plants that will help in this, you know, horribly stressed climate that we have going on right now in this very overdeveloped uh, you know, some of these invasives that will grow in a crack in a sidewalk, <laughs> please let it. If it's, if it's the only thing, my only shade tree and I'm in a hot urban environment, you say, nope, it's got to be native. Another thing I think about this idea of limit it, limiting it, and this is what really scares me, Kathy, is all this legislation that's being passed that says it has to be native. One uh, law was just passed in North Carolina saying that, uh, I think, state 
parks and roadways that they could only plant native, um, that we are going to eliminate plants that are so useful in today's horrible environments, not to mention the cost. Uh, they were going to try to establish natives where these, you know, non-natives have already gotten to be so well adapted and the wildlife has already adopted them is useful. So why aren't we using our own eyes and the evidence that we see to guide us? Who, who are we to say we know better? Interesting. And I was thinking also about how uh, climate change and warming temperatures might affect even what that definition is of what's native to that area. Of course. We know they're migrating and we know that they're faster. And that's one of the things I laugh about, too, when people say, well, you know, they don't like native R's. Um, so, of course, I point them to the Mount Cuba trials. And uh, Have you already talked about that on a, on a previous podcast? Yeah, we've touched on it a little bit with some guests from Mount Cuba, but feel free to go into that. Well, of course, they've, they were testing the cultivars of many of our native plants to see which the pollinators made best use of. And they came up with the top plants. Um, you know, Echinacea purpurea, I think, was the one that definitely came out on top, that a cultivar, Fragrant Angel, then straight species purpurea, and then there were a whole bunch of cultivars of purpurea that were ranked much higher than the next straight species. So I found that very interesting. And I think I told you I heard Doug Tallamy last night uh, in Memphis do a brilliant talk on oaks. It was absolutely wonderful and fascinating, and he didn't mention native or non-native. But what I really liked about that was that um, he didn't dis the cultivars either and i'm sorry i've just gone blank where was i going Mm, that uh doug tallamy was talking about the oaks and oh oh um, oh, yeah mm -hmm. one of the complaints about the 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 people who don't like the natives cultivars and some people get all hot and bothered if you say native are okay we can play semantics but let's just say a cultivar of a native plant is that they might spread into the wild if they did were the is that not Mother Nature saying this is better adapted? That's what I keep going back to. Uh, if she's saying it's better adapted and the insects and the birds are saying, you know what, this stuff works for me, um, why aren't we accepting that evidence? And why isn't the evidence, why isn't the research going toward, let's see what's as good or better than native, uh, rather than trying to prove that natives are always better? So I asked Doug about that last night at the end of his talk. And unfortunately, it, it was kind of a long um, beginning, I guess, to my question because I wanted to lay the groundwork on it because in his own research, he has tested non-native genera, excuse me, species within a genera to closely related natives, natives and non-natives that were very closely related. And he shows in his, in his own data that the non-natives are often readily adapted to. In the first year of the study, there was no difference. In the second and third year, he said that they got better at evaluating. Now, I'm not sure exactly what that means. So they did show in the second and third year that the natives were preferred, except in one case, I know in Ulmus parvifolia was preferred over our native American elm, Ulmus americana. Ulmus parvifolia, of course, is an Asian species. Um, I think it's interesting if we were to line up the preferred, let the insects tell us, the natives they liked and the non-natives they liked, it might be that there are more mixed in there with the native than, than we think. So why isn't our research doing that? Why doesn't it say, let's take the 15% of our native plants that the insects really use for this terrestrial food web that's so important, and these non-natives that are proven to be beneficial, and use both. Why are we being told we can't use both? What is this plant shaming about? And are they not using their eyes to do the deep dive into this research? Hmm. And I think uh, there are big gaps in the research, as you point out, Carol, and I don't know where the funding would come for, uh, come from for it, but... Um, well, the, the funding studies... would come for it because you and I care. Mm -hmm. Because the uh, the nursery and greenhouse industry wants us to care, their people too, and they are telling us now which ones are good pollinator friendly. 
they're promoted as that. They can go do the Mount Echinacea study, read it, and carry those plants and advertise it. Uh, we're not just about pretty. That's another thing I want to say. They said they're only selected because they're prettier. No, they're selected for disease resistance, uh, drought or heat tolerance, more vigor, longer bloom season, more floriferous, um, different flower color. And then they tried, you know, uh, telling me again, tried to set out and show that cultivars um, with different types of foliage, with uh, foliage mutations, were less favored by insects. And he found out that there was no difference except in dark or burgundy colored foliage. They did to tend to avoid that a little bit more, but they actually preferred variegated over straight species. So I just, I want to reverse this trend of trying to prove natives are better and say, let's do research on what works best today. And let's all plant the heck out of them. Mm -hmm. Yeah, that's really interesting about the foliage, especially anybody who has variegated shrubs can definitely tell you that the insects are making lots of holes in them. <laughs> um, and definitely true about the burgundy or dark leaf with lots of anthracinins in it, that those are pretty much avoided, not just by insects, but I also think the deer and rabbits don't love them either. Well, that's always, yeah, that's a point that I'm luckily living out in the middle of nowhere with 23 rescue dogs. <laughs> I just wish a deer rabbit would come up and <laughs> try to eat something in my yard. Exactly. I do have a, I have a little bit of deer grazing around the edge. I did put in a small orchard. My background was actually in fruit. I ended up in ornamentals, but um, I'm really about well-adapted, low spray or no spray fruit growing. I'm just mm -hmm. not going to spray. I'm not a, totally 100% organic. I will occasionally reach for a pesticide or I wouldn't get any eggplant. But um, I've used very, very, very little, and I do have an orchard that I don't spray, and I do want to spread that out there, too. If people will look for those fruits that are regionally adapted, um, they can often do it no spray. So don't believe, um, I used to work for people who said you have to spray, right, in my major career. And I'm like, mm, nope. Mm -hmm. Yeah. And or tolerate a little bit of imperfection on your fruit. Yes, my you know. goodness. For imperfection is beautiful. Let's remember that. I heard uh, W. Gary Smith speak at the Greenville Symposium a few years ago, lucky enough to be on the same uh, podium. And he talks about the beauty and imperfection and the whole uh, wabi-sabi concept of the glory and decay and and imperfection and aging and how that all is part of nature. And it sure made me feel better about looking at my face in the morning. i tell you what. <laughs> and I think um, getting back to the native R subject or cultivars of native plants, there are, of course, naturally occurring ones that Mother Nature has selected. Yes. And then there are, of course, the ones bred by... Um, are plant companies that you mentioned and they're testing like you said and selecting for disease resistance yes. um, drought tolerance all of those great things yes. but what strikes me the most is that they are also making them more smaller and more compact thus uh, more accessible it. yeah it is yeah. I, I know and that's true i do agree that that's a need now for so many people with small um, yards and landscapes. I agree. I like the big guys, right? I've got room. Um, um, I, I want more large plants and I, I laugh a little bit about it. And I do understand it, Kathy, the need for it. But I say everything's bred to be the shape of a cow patty <laughs> these days. And, you know, Humpty Dumpty plants, you always need something out there that has a different growth habit. But that's, that's part of the fun. You know, we all can experiment and use different things. And, and thank you for bringing that up about the breeding because, yeah, a lot of these are natural natural selections. They occurred on their own in the wild, and hybrids also occur naturally in the wild. But I, I use apples as an example of uh, why people should think that breeding is bad. A lot of people love Honeycrisp. Honeycrisp has turned out to be a great parent for a whole bunch of new apples now. Cosmic Crisp, Ludacris, I love that name. Evercrisp, and my favorite, Sweet Tango, and there's another one called Sugar Bee. Now, why don't they have the word crisp in there? The reason is the others were deliberately bred by an apple consortium so that they could control the release of the trees. The other two were actually accidental crosses that apparently bees did on their own. 
so they could not use the word crisp in the name. But I said, for some reason, if people create a, a breed by tra carefully transferring pollen with a paintbrush from one flower to the next, that's bad. But if a bee does it, it's okay. Like, we're not an animal. And are you crunching on a nutritious carrot while you're saying breeding is bad? Um, there's a lot of hypocrisy, I think, in this, that we are fine with plant breeding if it helps us with our own health or even our medicines for the medicinal plants or makes things more drought tolerant. But we're not saying that could be good for animals or for insects or for all the other things out there that go, hey, what about me? Hmm. That's very true. And I would say, um, getting back to the breeding to keep things compact and small mm -hmm. and making it accessible to more people for their yes. garden and available at local garden centers, um, just because a lot of those people wouldn't be exposed to some of these native plants if they weren't there. True. Very. That's a good point, Kathy. I'm 100% I'm with you. Hmm. So let's talk a little bit about um, some native plants that are not so beneficial, um, maybe ones with toxic foliage mm -hmm. or ones like poison ivy that it's beautiful at a distance, right? And mm -hmm. does have um, some pollinator benefit, but do we want that in our garden? Right. It's certainly not something you want. I'm not allergic, thank goodness. So it, it's tolerated in my garden. Uh, it is useful for wildlife. I, amazingly, birds can eat the fruit of poison ivy. It's in the same family as, uh, of course, sumac. Um, so, yeah, sometimes you don't want that and you need to be rid of that. I, again, I have, I'm lucky to have this 118 acres, so I can let a lot of things that I don't allow in the two or three acres I garden around the house go as wild as they like out there. But the interesting thing to me is how useful all those plants are. We say not as useful, and we mentioned all the different ways that they are. I think there are other things we have to consider. Uh, I took, like as I mentioned, climatology, and I remember my climatology professor at Mississippi State, Dr. Charles Wax, pretending to be a sunbeam, and he's leaving the sun, and he's you know, rocketing along toward Earth, and as he gets toward the Earth, he either bounces off of a cloud or he um, uh, hits a black pavement and is absorbed or he goes into the canopy of a tree and creates all this magical photosynthesis on which we all uh, survive. And that cooling effect, I, I want to say in today's climate change, anything that will grow, anything that will cover this earth with more green vegetation is much more important, whether, with, whether it's used by this or that. Let's Let's please embrace not cleaning up our garden. If you can let that poison ivy stay, please do. I, over my years of my career, I watched so many people move to the country and buy a nice piece of, of country property and then clean it up. You know, spray the herbicides to make sure that the pastures were all grass. Spray the fence rows to make sure that the things that naturally, that the birds planted along the fence rows are gone. Whether they were native or non-native, cleaning up, cleaning up is the problem. We don't need to tidy up all the time. We need to let places be wild that can be wild. And there are ways to make it beautiful. I go back to W. Gary Smith and looking for patterns and things. And, and Margie Ruddock, I, got, I was lucky enough to speak with her at the Davis Symposium years ago. And she said, if you just impose strong geometry on a site, you could let Mother Nature plant it. And it'll still look very intentional and designed. She said, you may wish to edit or embellish, but honestly, it will look like the hand of man has done a beautiful design there. And that, that's, that's what I beg people to do. Love weeds. I don't care if they're native or non-native. Love them. It, it, you know, some you don't want near the house. Some you don't want around your kids or dogs. I get all that. But any place you can... Um, fight your HOA. <laughs> fight your HOA. Let's do what we can to provide more weeds for everything. Mm -hmm. 
I love that. And I, I do prefer a little bit of a wild and woolly look, even on my little urban plot, <laughs> much, yeah, much to the dismay of some neighbors, but yes. Yeah. So um, speaking of a few, I'm going to call these out to you and I hope you can defend them and why we still want them in our garden. Um, what people have said to me are useless, and I hate the word useless, okay. plants. And one of them is camellia. Um, again, cover. Bees will visit it on a mild winter day. The If you like tea, you like camellia, right? I mean, we don't use our highly ornamental, but still there are um, tea camellias mm -hmm. that you can grow and embrace in your own garden. Uh, birds will nest in them. They are good cover. If you notice that birds will often go into broadleaf shrubs for protection from wind and cold and rain. Uh, there's so many things that they can do, not to mention getting you out on a winter day to walk among your plants and enjoy that and be restored. Because I hate it. Don't, don't think I hate it is when people say gardening season is over. Mm. It's never over. It's never over. Yeah. <laughs> There's always something out there. You just got to get out there and look. And uh, Yep. So. It's either in hyperdrive or it's in a little bit of a slowdown mode, but it's never over. It's not never over. What, and I'm going to insert one for you here if you let me be a little bit bossy. Mm -hmm. There's a Bermuda grass, which is the most common turf probably down here in the south. Uh, is you know, Lawns are often called ecological deserts. Well, now we know that Bermuda grass has become the preferred larval food for some of the grass skippers, in particular the fiery skipper, my favorite. And I think that it just it depends on how you treat your turf grass. It's an ecological desert if you bombard it with pesticides in order to keep it golf course perfect. And again, I'm going to go back to damning the HOAs, not the turf grass. Um, the Bermuda grass is actually a great anchor for soil. It is, it may dry up and look brown in the summer, but it holds the soil and it greens right back up when we get a good rain. It just means less mowing. So they actually are very good at slowing runoff. And one of the things I did want to talk about is the importance of some of these plants that are despised in slowing runoff. Because what really scares me, Kathy, is the water crisis. We have so many people moving to Tennessee now from the West because they can't get water mm. to garden. They're start coming to Tennessee and say, I want to have a lavender farm. And I don't think so in Tennessee. I'll, I'll help you maybe try it, but we can come across with some other things you can do as well. But twice last year, well, last year and the year before, I crossed the Mississippi River at Memphis to do a talk in Texas, and it was dry. They had one little channel dredged just deep enough for the boats to pass through Memphis. The Mississippi River at Memphis was dry. Now, that really hammered it home to me how much we have disturbed the hydrologic cycle. And that's why I say plant green whatever will grow in that crack in that sidewalk. Because the plants, of course, were the regulators. The plants were the things that stopped the raindrops, slowed them down, absorbed it, Groundwater, groundwater feeds 40% of the level in our rivers and streams and lakes. It's groundwater fed. So what do we do? We, you know, we tell people to put in drains. We push it off. We run it down the street into the gutters as fast as we can. We wonder why we have big flooding downstream. We wonder why we're so dead gum dry up here. And more plants, more shade, whatever will grow. Please, please, please. We, we have messed up the hydrologic cycle. I'm going to go back to Dr. Wax. He said the next world wars will be about water, not oil. And we're seeing that already. We're having states argue over who owns this river. And rivers are gone now before they ever get to the ocean again. Whole towns are doing without power. Uh, it's, it's really scary. And I think the answer is plants. Doesn't matter what they are. Dead gum it. Get some green on the house, wherever you can, on that concrete. Let's stop. This stuff, this is another, I know I'm, going, I'm on a rant right now, but one more. Why do we have dark roofs? Hmm. When we know we're heating up and dark pavement, you know they've done some studies out west where they have whitewashed certain pavements, made them lighter colored, and the street temperatures drop by a couple of degrees. I, 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 this The water crisis is really what scares me right now. And if 
Lawns will slow water and let them percolate down and restore our aquifers, which are dropping like crazy. Then just quit dissing lawn. Mm-hmm. Or at least a mixed lawn instead yeah. of just the straight turf grass lawn. Yes, because yep. it's not, it's going to be a mixed lawn unless you're bombarding it with pesticides, herbicides. Mm-hmm. It's going to be. Yep. Let the let the weedy lawns rejoice. Yes. <laughs> so in our last few minutes, um, can you let us know how readers can and listeners can contact you to find out more? I don't have a website, and I should. I know a lot of people ask me where I'm going to be next, and uh, you know my writings that are kind of 20 years worth of columns that I need to put together. I know in a book, but um, find me at Carol Reese. You may have to put Tennessee in there, or horticulturist, or dogs, or something. (laughs) But but you'll find me. Um, And I also want to recommend a really good website uh, put together by my friend Mary McAllister called Conservation Sense and Nonsense. And in there, she has an enormous array of reference scientific material that will back up this disturbing move that it has to be native and that they're removing non-natives. Um, absolutely wonderful, hardworking woman who was walking her dog every every morning around Oakland, California, and noticed that they were ripping out well-adapted trees and trying to replace them with natives and that the birds were leaving. And so she got to be quite an activist and with no background whatsoever, it simply undertook studying this on her own. And she's amassed a great, great wealthy source of knowledge about it. Hmm. Yeah, we'll definitely need that link and put that in our show notes for everybody to access. And Kathy, I want to thank you. I mean, I appreciate this. I, I do come under fire uh, for taking this stance, so, you know, I've been accused of uh, being funded by Big Hort or, you know, Big Turf Grass. And I assure everyone, I came under fire around here for my at my job because of my stance on reducing pesticides and using what works. And I have been an activist since the Vietnam War. I will speak up when I think something's wrong. And I feel like I'm speaking up right now for the insects. I'm trying to say, please, please, let us use everything that helps them. Let's, let's just try to hold hands. I need a kumbaya moment. I, I told Doug that last night. I said, I want to. <laughs> I don't want this divisiveness between gardeners. We all care very much about the little things that run the world, it, as the great, late, great E.L. Wilson would say. Um, we need to be on the same page. And, and I don't want people to think that somehow I'm, I'm, I have character flaws because I think non-native plants work. I have proved non-native plants work. I want everybody to get together on this. We're stronger united. Hmm. Agreed, Carol. And thank you so much for sharing and sticking your neck out. And <laughs> You do. And, and letting us uh, have some food for thought and maybe reevaluating some of those things that we've been taught. Thank you, Kathy. Sweet gum plant profile. The American sweet gum tree, liquid amber, styrosa flua, is an attractive tree that is native to North America. It has beautiful fall foliage and unique spiny fruit balls. The leaves have a camphor-like scent When crushed, the fruits are often called gumballs. They dry out in the autumn and then fall to the ground in great numbers. Crafters gather these balls to make holiday decorations and use them in floral arrangements. If you do not care for the fruit drop, select Rotunda Loba, which is a non-fruiting cultivar. Sweet gum trees are hardy to USDA zones 5 to 9. Planted in full to part sun, fertilize and water the tree consistently during the first few years after planting it. Once established, it is drought tolerant and no longer needs fertilizer. It forms a pleasing pyramid-like form naturally and should not need any pruning, other than to remove any damaged or diseased branches. The tree will grow to 50 to 80 feet high at maturity but there are some dwarf and smaller versions available as well. 
Sweet gum, you can grow that. What's new in the garden this week? Well, in my home garden, the bright spots are the alyssum. That's a cool season annual that I've had since early spring. I bought a couple six packs, one of a white flowering alyssum and one of a purple flowering one and stuck them in containers here and there. And they survived the hot summer and now they are flourishing. They are just covered in flowers and looking fabulous and the little bees and I think some little native flies are also on them as well. They're just a buzz right now. And over at the community garden, we're picking a salad from our, the arugula we grew starting in early September. And the radishes are almost done as well. And we even have some turnips that germinated and are starting to form. Might even be able to have them on the Thanksgiving table. Some local gardening events, if you are in the mid-Atlantic U.S., that you might want to attend include birding walks at Winterthur, and this is right outside of Wilmington, Delaware, at Winterthur Gardens, and that takes place on November 15th from 8 a.m. to 10 a.m., and there is another one on December 20th. You will be exploring bird hotspots at Winterthur, including wetlands, meadows, and woodlands along Clenny Run, which provide excellent avian habitat year-round. Bring your binoculars and dress for the weather. Registration is required at winterthur.org, and the fee is $20, $10 if you are a member. And then not too far away on... Uh, November 18th from 10 a.m. to 12 noon in Philadelphia, Pennsylvania at Bartram's Garden is a class on botanical simple syrups. Learn to create simple syrups using plants that add health and wild flavor to your everyday cooking in life. And so they're going to be made from flowers, herbs, and spices in your garden. Then they'll tell you how to make meals and baked goods, create cocktails and mocktails with them. General admission is $20, is $15 for Bartram's Gardens members. And finally, at Homestead Gardens in Davidson Mill, Maryland, is a make-and-take wreath-making workshop on December 8th at 10 a.m. to 11 a.m. And this is at both their Davidsonville and Smyrna, Delaware locations. Um, $85 is the fee, and it's an exciting interactive workshop where you'll be able to make your own wreath, with experts on staff and then take it home and decorate your own home with it. Happy gardening! Get low maintenance alternative salons with the new book Ground Cover Revolution by Kathy Jentz. Reducing the lawn is among the biggest trends in home ownership, with an endless stream of homeowners looking for an eco-friendly alternative to a traditional, everyday grass lawn. In the last few years alone, over 23 million American adults converted part of the lawn to a natural landscape, and now are looking to do even more. The biggest challenge to adopting this new ideal of perfect lawn is knowing how and when to replace your turf and which plants are the best ones for the job. Ground Cover Revolution is here with all the answers you need. Included are 40 in-depth profiles of plants that are perfect choices for replacing a grass lawn. There are options for sun, for shade, for dry and wet sites, and for various climates around the globe. There are choices that bloom, options that are evergreen, and selections that are deer-resistant. Author Kathy Jens has also included an incredibly useful chart that gives you all the details on each of the 40 choices for quick reference and to make your ground cover selection process even easier. Whether you want to replace the entire lawn or just reduce the amount of land dedicated to turf, Ground Cover Revolution will help you usher in a new and improved idea of what a beautiful lawn should be. Available at bookstores now and also at Quarto.com, where you can get 30% off using discount code GARDENING30. Hey there, garden lovers. This is Ray Eaton, founder of Discover Garden Tours. I'm here to invite you all to join us next April and experience the beauty of Dutch gardening and horticulture on our Discover the Netherlands tour. Please join us and speaker, author, and social media influencer Kathy Jentz for this once-in-a-lifetime garden adventure. 
we'll visit private and public gardens, flower shows and auctions, and much, much more. Highlights include the Kuchenhof Gardens, Hortus Botanicus Leiden, and the Flora Holland Flower Auction. The tour dates are from April 16th through April 25th, 2024. Full details and registration are available on our website at discoverourtours.com. Remember, space is limited, so if you don't want to miss out, I would highly recommend signing up today. We look forward to seeing you in the Netherlands and sharing this unforgettable journey together. In the new book, The Urban Garden by Kathy Jensen Terry Spade, you'll find dozens of inspiring and creative ways to grow flowers, shrubs, vegetables, herbs, and other plants in small spaces and with a limited budget. Whether you want to grow on a balcony, rooftop, front stoop, or a tiny urban patio, turn your growing dreams into reality and build a gorgeous and unique garden that showcases your personal style while still being functional and productive. With the ingenious ideas and resourceful tactics found here, you'll be maximizing yields and beauty from every square inch of your space while also making a lush outdoor living area you'll crave spending time in. Whether you're growing edible plants or beautiful flowers, the 101 amazing growing ideas found in the urban garden will turn your tiny urban yard into a treasure trove of green you'll be proud to share with family and friends. Buy your copy today at your local retail bookseller or order it online now at amazon.com or bookshop.org. This is the last word on Cooking with Pumpkins by Christy Page at the Vu Gardening Network. There are several things that scream fall to me. Colorful leaves, brisk mornings, fresh apples everywhere, and pumpkins. As soon as fall arrives, so does my need to fire up my stove and get baking. It warms the house and our tummies. When it comes to fall baking, my number one item is apples, but pumpkins are a very close second. I love to make pumpkin pie, pumpkin bread, and even pumpkin whoopie pies. A soft, gooey whoopie pie filled with my mom's special filling, hint, the secret ingredient is fluff, is the height of fall for me every year. Typically, I buy canned pumpkin at the store. It's easier, a lot faster. But a few years ago, I went rogue and decided to use fresh pumpkins. It all started out innocently enough. I had taken a drive down a back road and came across a stand filled with pumpkins. I started chatting with the owner. He shared that he hadn't intended to have as many pumpkins as he had this year, and he hadn't tended to them as much as he normally would. So while they were all great sizes, they were not necessarily the shapes that people were looking for. Well, they all looked great to me, and he was offering them at a bargain price. So I decided to fill up my car. I may have gone a little overboard, and I arrived home with 15 pumpkins. My family thought that I had finally lost my mind. We chose a few for decorating, but the big question was what to do with the rest of them. I felt inspired and stated that I was going to use them for baking and cooking. My entire Saturday was spent trying to tackle the never-ending Tower of Pumpkins. They all needed to be washed and opened, deseeded, cut up, peeled, cooked. It was a way bigger project than I had anticipated. I spent hours prepping and cooking all of those pumpkins. Most of the pumpkins were mashed, strained, and ready to use for baking. I cut some out to use right away and froze the rest. In my mind, I was envisioning fresh pumpkin pie at the holidays. I will admit, though, I was getting a little tired. The last few pumpkins were left in chunks while I frantically looked up recipes in which I could use all of the pumpkin goodness. I finally decided to just roast some of them and serve them with our meals for the week. It was a very yummy solution. The next afternoon, I was ready to bake. I made my first pie with fresh pumpkin. The smell throughout the house was heavenly. Waiting for it to cool felt like torture. Finally, after dinner, we were ready to give it a try. All I could think was that this was going to be the best pie ever. All of the hours of prep work were going to pay off. My husband took his first bite. I leaned forward in anticipation. He looked at me and said, it tastes the same as it usually does. I was heartbroken. All I could think of was the hours of prep I had put into this pie. I will say that that fall and winter, I used all the fresh pumpkin in the freezer. We had it with several meals, and it was included in a lot of my baking. 
But after that year, I switched back to Camp Pumpkin. I did enjoy knowing the amount of love and effort that went into prepping my fresh pumpkin, but I just haven't quite been ready to tackle that project again. Maybe next year, if my pumpkin patch takes off. This was the last word on Cooking with Pumpkins with Christy Page at foodgardening.com. Thank you for listening to Garden DC. You can become a listener supporter for as little as 99 cents a month by going to anchor.fm slash garden DC slash support. Another way to support this podcast is to subscribe to our monthly digital publication, Washington Gardener Magazine. To do so, go to washingtongardener.com. Thank you. You can find Washington Gardener online at WashingtonGardener.com, on Twitter at WDC Gardener, on Instagram at WDC Gardener, and on Facebook.com at Washington Gardener Magazine. Thank you for listening to Garden DC. You can become a listener supporter for as little as 99 cents a month by going to podcasters.spotify.com slash pod slash show slash garden DC. Another way to support this podcast is to subscribe to our monthly digital publication, Washington Gardener Magazine. To do so, go to washingtongardener.blogspot.com. Thank you. You can find and follow Washington Gardener on Twitter slash X, Instagram and Pinterest at WDC Gardener, and on Facebook at Washington Gardener Magazine. Please take a moment to rate and review this podcast on Spotify and Apple. Open the Spotify or Apple app, search for Garden DC, check on the rate button, and select five stars.